I'm Brina Garen, and you're listening to Hex Positive. Welcome, witches. This is episode three of Hex Positive. I'm your host, Brain Nagarin, and today we'll be diving into the title of this podcast. We'll be talking about what it means to be Hex Positive and breaking down some of the myths and misconceptions associated with cursing and hexing. Buckle up, this one's probably going to make some people mad. Jeez, Brie, hitting the controversy bottle a little hard right off the bat, aren't we? Hush me, it needs doing. Just a quick note before we dive in. I know everyone is familiar with the terms white magic and black magic, or I at least assume we are. I do not like these terms. I do not use these terms. There are way too many problems with them on a number of levels. Duality, cultural connotations, racism, the exclusion of gray areas, and so on. And we'll talk about that in depth in a future episode. But for the purposes of this podcast, I'll be using beneficial magic and baneful magic to describe these concepts. Uh, Beneficial magic, of course, being any magic that helps, and baneful magic being any magic that harms. Still some gray areas, still room for interpretation, but they're much more neutral as words go. Uh, With that out of the way, let's get into it. So... The title of this show is Hex Positive, and I did choose that for a reason, not just because it's catchy. The term sex positive has a lot of different uh, definitions, but mostly it references the idea that people should be able to make the choice to explore their sexuality in a safe, consensual fashion if they want to. If they want to. Not that they're required to, but if they want to... uh, and that they should be able to do this without being shamed or ridiculed, taking into account important things like being old enough to make that decision and the necessity of content of consent rather between uh, participants. All very necessary things. Uh, so hex positive is an extension of that. It's the same basic idea, but applied to cursing and baneful magic, which have a firmly established place in the canon of witchcraft history but which are somewhat frowned upon in certain circles of the modern witch community. Hex positive, to me, means that every witch should be able to choose to explore the use of baneful magic if they want to. If they want to. Not that they're required to, but if they want to. And again, that they should be able to do this without being shamed or ridiculed. If you're thinking, that sounds like a witchcraft version of being pro-choice, then you've got the idea. Uh, I did not come up with the term hex positive. I've seen it tossed around online a lot. Uh, If someone knows who used it first, let me know. I'd love to congratulate them. Uh, It's a wonderful term and we're sticking with it. So I know at least a few of you are probably already going, but Brie, what about the rule of three or the threefold law or the law of returns or karma? or however you define some sort of cosmic retribution for using magic for less than friendly purposes. <sighs> okay, full disclosure, curse shaming is beyond a pet peeve for me. This is a peeve that lives in my house. I feed it, I take it for walkies, it sleeps at the foot of my bed. We are well acquainted. So if I sound just a little bit salty this episode, please understand that I've had more than a few, shall we say, spirited conversations on this topic. And I will be talking about Wicca a lot because it's relevant to the topic. But again, I'm going to do my best to be polite because it's not cool to go around trashing other people's religions. So yeah, even though this is something that chaps my bunions something fierce... 
I'm going to do my best to remain very respectful and not play the blame game and just sort of stick to the facts and the philosophical, moral, and ethical arguments uh, involved with this particular issue. Because being rude and shouty about it <laughs> is not going to help me accomplish anything. So, as far as I can tell, the root of this modern aversion to cursing has a lot to do with the proliferation of Wiccan moral ideas in pagan communities. Uh, part of the growth of Wicca involved making witchcraft more palatable for the general, read, mostly Christian, public, uh, which meant anything to do with baneful magic was verboten, not welcome, O-U-T. Uh, there is a concerted effort to distance the movement from that sort of magic. Uh, this is also where the Satanic and Luciferian witches got thrown under the bus a lot, but I digress. Uh, as most of us know, there's a pretty integral pair of couplets in that poem that gets called the Wiccan Reed, uh, which run a little something like this. Mind the threefold law you should, three times bad and three times good. And the other one... These eight words the reed fulfill, and it harm none, do what ye will. Which most practitioners seem to take as do not ever use any magic ever that is anything less than friendly and beneficial and good because it will come back three times over and ruin your life. Insert sound of salt shaker here. So here's the thing. The Wiccan reed is exactly that. It's Wiccan. A read is a set of guidelines. The words it the word itself means uh, advice or counsel. Uh, so it's not a mandate or a divine law. It's not enforced by any higher cosmic power, phenomenal cosmic power. Uh, but it does provide that all important moral and ethical code for one's practice. If you're a Wiccan. If you want to hear more about the history of the read and how it evolved and what it means, Trey Dorn did a really great in-depth piece on it back in episode 9, I think, of BS Free Witchcraft. Uh, the trouble is that there's such a prevalence of Wiccan authors and ideas in modern pagan literature that Wiccan ideas get mistaken for some kind of universal approach for all witches everywhere. And they're not. They're really, really not. Uh, despite what some people may think or may tell you, you know, we've been over this, not all witches are Wiccan, and therefore are not bound by the same rules or bylaws as Wiccans. Uh, being prevalent and popular is not the same as being universal. And, of course, this is not to say that Wiccan ideas are bad. I'm just saying that they are not applicable to all witches everywhere the way some people seem to think they are. Uh, we see this a lot in concepts like the Wheel of the Year, uh, certain ideas about binary and duality and gender in deities, historical revisionism, my other pet peeve, Ideas about uh, the necessity of the length of study and the need for direct mentorship and initiation. And of course, my personal favorite, this idea of reciprocal ethics and the aversion to baneful magic. We are going to get into all of these things at some point. But for right now, let's just focus on that last one. Uh, before we get fully into it, here's your vocabulary lesson for the day. Reciprocal ethics. This is the moral principle which holds that whatever you do to others, whatever you create, whatever you destroy, whatever actions you take, that will somehow be visited back on you in some form, at some point, in some way. It's similar to the idea of karma, except that karma is much more complex and involves multiple lifetimes, not just your current one. Uh, reciprocal ethics, in the simplest possible terms, is a reminder that everything you do has consequences. Now, it's very important to note that the idea of the rule of three or the threefold law as a law that 
specifically applies only to witches is a fairly recent invention. The idea of hard and fast and very literal reciprocal ethics was based on Monique Wilson's interpretation of a general idea presented in Gardner's works and Gwen Thompson's Read of the Wickeye Eye poem, and then this interpretation was expanded upon and popularized by Raymond Buckland, whose works went on to influence many of the more well-known names in modern pagan literature, including the rather infamous Silver Ravenwolf. If you know me, you know my thoughts on those two, and I will keep them to myself for the time being. Uh, so when you hear of this idea that the threefold law is a hard and fast universal law meant to apply to all witches everywhere, it's basically because of that. A couple of people made one interpretation of a sort of nebulous concept regarding reciprocal ethics, and it stuck. And because their works became so popular and were foundational texts for so many witches in the latter part of the 20th century, and even today in some spheres actually, uh, this idea, this one interpretation became mistaken for a universal ethical code for all witches everywhere. Which is why we now have curse shaming. Do you want curse shaming? Because that's how you get curse shaming. Uh, if you've run into this before, you're probably already groaning and making the frustrated claw hands like I do. If you haven't run into curse shaming, um, lucky you. It's similar to most other kinds of shaming, as you might expect. Uh, it basically involves someone taking an imaginary moral high ground over someone else based solely on that person's use or support of baneful magic. You know, oh my god, you use curses! Don't you know that's wrong? Don't you understand karma and the threefold law? You get the idea. Does what it says on the tin. And it's not always just Wiccans who do this, but it is often people who follow or who have been heavily influenced by Wiccan principles that we find engaging in this sort of behavior. And just like every other kind of fundamentalist, they can be really freaking annoying. Deep cleansing breath. Now, if you don't want to use curses or hexes in your practice, if you don't want to use bindings or any kind of magic that isn't strictly considered good and beneficial by whatever standards you're using, that's fine. If you want to follow the threefold law because you're a Wiccan or because it's a moral concept that jives with you, that's fine. I am by no means trashing the idea of having morals and ethics in your practice. It's good stuff for everybody. Where we get into hand slap territory is when you start trying to force those ideas on others. If someone isn't Wiccan or doesn't wish to follow the threefold law, it's not my place or your place or anyone else's place to come and tell them that they're wrong for doing something that a particular path or a particular tradition considers immoral or problematic. We didn't like it when other people forced their ideas on us. We shouldn't do it to each other. Using baneful magic is not like other problematic behaviors. It's not like cultural appropriation or racism or xenophobia or gender discrimination. If someone wants to hex the pants off someone else, they're not at risk of harming or excluding or denigrating an entire demographic of people. And if they are, that is a really nasty curse and they likely have bigger problems. This is small scale problematic. This is person to person problematic. This is, I don't like your blue shirt problematic. This is, you're not a real witch because you don't do spirit work problematic. It's a single set of ideas that has been mistaken for universal fact when it hardcore isn't. We'll be back with more Hex Positive after this brief sponsored break. This episode of Hex Positive was brought to you by the written works of Rose Auriculum. 
If you're enjoying the show and looking for books to expand your witchcraft library, then pick up the works of Rose Auriculum. Of witchcraft and whimsy packs an afternoon tea's worth of introductory spells, common sense advice, discussion on techniques and methodology, and the kind of answers you won't easily find on search engines into a slim little volume you can enjoy over your lunch hour. If you like the kind of welcoming, friendly attitude you find in the best parts of the online witch community, you'll love this book. Rose packs accessibility, down-to-earth know-how, and plenty of whimsy into this book. And it's a great read for any witch just finding their feet. And if you'd like to add a little bit of love to your craft, pick up pastel spells to go with it. This pocket-sized book features loads of easy spells that any witch can do, no matter their experience level, with simple materials that you probably already have in your witchy toolkit. Like all the best spells, they can be expanded to include as much ritual or spiritual involvement as you want, and can be adapted to any path you happen to be on. Plus, this book focuses on a wonderful array of magical workings for self-love, self-care, healing, and repairing and maintaining the relationships in your life. Something we could all use a little more of right about now. Head over to Amazon and check out Of Witchcraft and Whimsy and Pastel Spells by Rose Auriculum. That's O-R-R-I-C-U-L-U-M. And follow the author on Twitter and Instagram at at Auriculum today. Because let's face it, we could all use a bit more whimsy in our witchcraft. And now, back to the show. Curses have a firmly fixed place in the annals of witchcraft history. To paraphrase Vicini, it's a prestigious line of work with a long and glorious tradition. They're a part of the craft, for better or worse, just like luck magic or protection magic or healing magic, and if you don't like it, you don't have to use it, but that doesn't mean you get to drag people who do. And conversely, if you do use baneful magic, that doesn't mean you get to trash people who don't use it as naive or cowardly or fluffy. It's a personal choice, and that choice needs to be respected. So now that we've got the moral side of the issue out of the way, let's talk about the theoretical and metaphysical side. This idea of your works being visited back on you threefold. Because... I know this is something that still worries a lot of the newer witches that I've talked to. I've been asked a number of times something along the lines of, I'm not Wiccan, but I've heard of this rule of three thing. Will something bad happen to me if I mess up a spell or if I curse someone? Like the, Some of these poor darlings are convinced that their pets will get sick, their house will burn down, they'll crash their car something catastrophic because they hex somebody to have a bad day or flunk a test or whatever. The Buckland interpretation, and I'm going to call it that because he was the one who is largely responsible for pushing this idea, holds that if you use magic to harm someone else, the universe will punish you threefold for whatever you did. It will be swift it will be direct, and it will hurt. Which sounds strangely an awful lot like everything that's bad happening in your life is your own fault because you're a filthy sinner, uh, especially for someone who spent a lot of his time bashing Christians. But I digress. Uh, there are three problems that I have with the Buckland interpretation of this concept. The first is that it basically reads like a mid-20th century white people misinterpretation of karma. Uh, like I mentioned before, karma is a complex concept. There is nothing instant about karma. This is not cup noodles and coffee. Uh, karma involves the full weight of everything you've done over multiple lifetimes when your whole journey of birth, death, and reincarnation is over. That's when karma hits. Not two weeks from now, not ten years from now, not in this lifetime. Uh, second, why should this idea of short-term cosmic retribution apply only to witches? Why should it only be witches who have to watch what they do? If this is a universal truth, shouldn't it apply to everyone? 
I, why limit it to the use of magic? Shouldn't everyone be getting smacked with a cosmic 2 by 4 for their wrongdoings? Ooh, that would be satisfying. It, witches aren't inherently any better or worse than anyone else, and holding them to that standard seems very unfair. Plus, you and I both know that cosmic retribution for misdeeds doesn't happen nearly as often as it ought to. Imagine how different the world would be if the universe, in whatever shape you give it, actually stepped in to punish rotten people for their misdeeds in the short term. Can you imagine how different the landscape of, oh, say, the American political administration would look if this were something that happened in real time? All I can say is certain press conferences would be a lot more interesting. And this leads into my third issue. Why does this rule of three only seem to apply to baneful magic? Uh, in Gardner's book, High Magic's Aid, which is what's being cited in the commonly referenced Thompson Reed poem, the text indicates that a witch ought to pay back whatever they're being dealt three times over, uh, whether it's good or bad. Uh, so if we go by the original text, the threefold law isn't about getting punished for what you do. It's not about getting what you do give, it's about giving what you've gotten. I like this interpretation. I'm not a Wiccan, as we've discussed, and I'm not the biggest fan of Gardner either, but I really like this concept. If someone does a kindness for you, give it back three times over. Help them out, make their life better in some way, go out of your way to do a good deed, or pay it forward, however you manage to get that good back out there in some sort of increased capacity. But if someone hurts you, if they betray you, if they mess with your life, if they come for your near and dear, you bury them and piss on the ashes. I'm really about that. Me, personally, I think that the universe is a very busy place. I think that the powers that be, however one defines them, have a lot of work on their hands. And when slights and misdeeds and general bad behavior go divinely unpunished, I think sometimes a witch just has to step in and be an instrument of cosmic justice. Can curses backfire? Of course they can. Any spell can. Any action, magical or otherwise, has the potential for some kind of fallout. And that's the part you need to keep in mind. That's what I think the Wiccan Reed is really saying. Remember that your actions have weight. They have impact. And there will be consequences to everything, for good or for ill. And when we work magic, we have to be prepared to accept that. So, to curse or not to curse? That is the question. And the simple answer is, it's up to you. If you decide it's not for you, whether because of the read or your own personal moral code, that's okay. If you decide you want to give it a try, that's okay too. And you can always change your mind. That's the great thing about learning. You can assimilate new concepts and change your views based on what you find out. Whatever you decide, I do recommend learning about Baneful Magic in a theoretical sense, if nothing else. Even if you never, ever plan to use it, it's good to understand a little of how it works so that you know how to defend yourself if anyone else decides to throw something nasty at you. Being nice doesn't mean you have to be a doormat. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about ethics and theory today, so if you're still here, thank you for sticking it out. I know that can be a lot, um, and I know that this is a touchy issue for people, so if you're uh, still here after all of that, thank you as well. Um, I'm definitely going to be addressing the practical side of Baneful Magic in a future episode. I'll talk about what kinds of Baneful spells you can cast, the methodology behind them, the components involved, and how to sling those hexes as safely as possible. But 
that is something for another time. Next time, I'll be answering the question most frequently asked by my blog followers. Do you have any advice for beginner witches? The answer is a resounding yes. Yes, I do. Lots and lots. So tune in next time and I'll dish out all the stuff I wish somebody had told me when I was a baby witch. So that's our show for this month. Once more, I'm your host, Bree Nagarin, and I'll see you next time. Hex Positive is a proud member of the Nerd and Tie Podcast Network. Check out everything they have to offer, including our sibling podcast, BS Free Witchcraft, over at nerdandtie.com. Intro and outro music by Kevin McLeod. For all the latest updates, follow at hex underscore podcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at at Brina Garin on Twitter and Instagram. For more information on my books, you can check out my WordPress and my Amazon author page. And if you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash Stay safe, wash your hands, and remember, always practice safe hex.